Yeah. So uh, what we have been doing till now is to study specific physical processes which which will play a role in the uh, in the physics of stars. So now let me just today change gear a bit. See next after the convective transport, the next obvious step is what is called radiative transport. That is without matter being transported, heat is being transported from one portion of the star to another. But I will just do it later, but I will just put the whole thing in the context of stellar physics by telling you some overall picture about star formation. Um, so the right in the beginning, we are, it's believed that the universe was completely homogeneous isotropic over all scales. And due to quantum fluctuations, okay, due to quantum fluctuations, small perturbations in density were produced. Now, these perturbations in density collapse due to gravity and form clumps of high density contrast. And these continue to collapse to form clouds which are of galactic masses. And these you call galactic clouds. Now, after the galactic clouds are formed, now, if suppose you have, uh, okay, so let me just do it here. Suppose you have a cloud which is exactly spherically symmetric. Then, of course, the whole thing will just collapse into a small spherically symmetric large mass object. However, because of these quantum fluctuations which produce these density fluctuations, the everything is not spherically symmetric. Typically, suppose I have a lump of this kind, then what will happen? This lump will actually start collapsing here more than other places. So this will become something like this. And as it collapses further, this, this is a schematic I'm doing. This thing will pinch off into a separate thing and the rest of will pinch off into a separate thing. And as this collapses, it can become like this and later become like this. So like this, you have so many clumps. In general, because of this lack of spherical symmetry, instead of the whole cloud collapsing into one single star, these clouds actually fragment. Something like if you put... Hi, Anirudh. Hello, Sesh. Like, you know, if you put, if you keep a large, if you keep a small mercury drop on the floor, it will remain a mercury drop. Now, if you put a large drop, it will randomly fragment into uh, small drops of different sizes and masses. That is precisely the kind of thing which it happens because of the fact that the initial conditions are not perfectly spherically symmetric. There are local regions where there is more collapse than the other regions. And as a result, this whole cloud fragments into small cloudlets. Now, the question one can ask is, is there some general rule to tell how many clouds are there with a given mass? That is, if suppose I start with a cloud, and this collapses into small clouds. I can ask the questions. In an interval, suppose uh, I have n into delta m. Okay, rather I will say the following. 
n m dm equal to number of clouds within a mass range m m plus dm okay and then i can say if i plot nm versus m what is there a definite shape of this curve i mean are you getting my point hello eh? uh, yes <laughs> okay like it seems a little fuzzy can you explain yeah. it again sir okay so basically what i am saying is if suppose you have an exactly spherically symmetric cloud it will become it will keep dancing in condensed into a spherically symmetric smaller cloud of high mass and small size that's okay yes yeah okay but now if suppose it is not spherically symmetric different regions of the cloud will have different amount of gravity right because the density will be different the shape will be different everything wherever there is high gravity and high density that will undergo a local collapse independent of the others like this okay yeah okay so it means in general since the original cloud is not perfectly spherically symmetric what you expect is that as the uh, as the Uh, as the cloud which is not perfectly symmetric collapses it will gradually collapse at different rates at different places and hence pinch off from each other as independent cloudlets just like if i as i said i put a large drop of mercury on the floor it will split and form lot of small droplets of different sizes are you with me yeah yeah harish yes sir yeah okay so now you can ask the question so it basically becomes like this so there will be cloudlets of different masses and a very important and interesting question in the physics of stars is Now, uh, if n m into d m is the number of clouds within a mass range m and m plus d m, then is there a definite shape of this function n m versus m? For example, suppose the total mass of the original cloud was capital M, and the thing was spherically symmetric. what will be the shape it will be like this and at m there will be one clump right yes okay similarly if suppose this were to uh, uh, fragment into two of them m1 and m2 such that m1 plus m2 equal to m this cloud would have become like so this would have been the shape in general you will have a kind of a continuum shape of different number of clouds in different mass range and this is called the initial mass function and is one of the very important topics in stellar astrophysics there are several models but they still you know like you always scope for you know uh, different things you know like what is it which determines the number of uh, th this number this function called the initial mass function all right yes now once Recent, say, uh, uh, recently they said uh, ivf is not same for all you know, galaxies like that's the yeah, right yeah yeah you see the point is yes you're right it will have an influence of the environment okay 
So, uh, so you know, like depending on various situations, you can ask what is the initial mass function. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is one. Thing. But now, what does this initial mass function mean? So now, if you have got cloudlets of different masses, each of the cloudlet will collapse and form a star. It means generally. Stars will occur in the form of a cluster of stars because all of them have, have formed from the original cloud, but this cloud fragmenting into different masses cloudlets and each forming a star. And there will be a lot of dust and gas left in the cloud, which did not get assimilated into the stars. And these will occupy the interstellar medium. Is this fine? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is to do with just the protostellar cloud. Now the question is, what is the condition that a cloudlet will turn out to be a star? And for this, what we need to remember is that in a system with finite temperature, the finite temperature the, will lead to an internal energy and the internal energy will try to disrupt the system. Just like a cylinder of gas which is open, it just uh, spreads because of the finite temperature. On the other hand, the gravitational interaction between different constituents of this will try to build the system. So there is a competition between internal energy trying to disrupt the system and gravitation trying to assimilate the system. And the whole story of star formation is the competition between these two effects. Now, for star formation, what is the condition we have? This is the total potential energy into some factor. I mean, potential energy of the system, gm square by r. And if n is the total number of particles in the system, and t is some kind of a te overall temperature of the system, then 3 by 2 n k t is the total internal energy of the system. Is this okay? Because half kT is the average energy per particle per degree of freedom. There are three degrees of freedom, three translational degrees of freedom. So half becomes three by two and there are n number of particles. And so the internal energy is three n by two kT. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And so what we need is gm square by r modulus should be greater than this quantity, which is 3 nkt by n. Now, what is this m? This m is basically mean mass of every particle times the number of particles. So out of this m square, one of the m, I will write it as m bar into n, rearrange it, and this inequality becomes m greater than 3 ktr by 2 g m bar. And this is some kind of a critical mass, which I call genes mass. And it means that if my, if my cloudlet has a mass greater than this genes mass, now what does the genes mass depend on? The genes mass depends on temperature, mass of the particle, and the radius in which the particle is spread. For example, if the, if, the, if the particles are spread in a large radius, then the gravitational field is not very strong and this inequality may not be satisfied. This side may be large. Similarly, if, if, similarly, if the temperature is very large, the internal energy will be very large and it may require a much larger mass to produce sufficient gravitational energy to overcome the thermal energy. So if T is large, again, this will be large. Okay. 
And if suppose you have the mass per particle, m bar is large, then the gravitational energy is large and you try to assimilate it better. So in other words, it is this. So in other words, the gene's mass depends on the radius and on the temperature and of course the mass per particle. And now I can actually, uh, what I can do is, I can write, the, let me see. So I have 3 kT by R 2 G M bar is equal to M J, which means, uh, so I call this the, okay, R is equal to 2 G M bar M J by 3 kT, R cube is equal to 2 by 3 kT G M bar M J. Okay. And so M J by R cube is Sorry. Mj by R cube is equal to Mj divided by 3 into 3 kT by 2 m bar cube Mj cube. I mean, there is a 4 pi 3 factor, of course. And this cancels to give me two, and that's what you give me. This is the density. Okay. So the density corresponding to this gene's mass is this. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, okay. So this is the density which is required for, uh, for uh, condensing this. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, how does the contraction to a protostar takes place? Now, in this process, the following thing happens. So when you have, originally, you have a very cold cloud. Now, the cloud is very, and so assume that, let us assume, Assume that uh, temperature is low because it starts from a cold cloud, and so and assume and only hydrogen. This is just for simplicity because in in reality there is seventy five percent hydrogen and twenty five percent helium from cosmic abundance. But let us just assume for simplicity there is only hydrogen. And at this temperature, hydrogen is in the molecular form. And so, as this system collapses, the height H2 will become 2H and H will go to H plus plus electron. Okay. So, as the system collapses, the potential energy change which is there, which is released, during the collapse, will go and ionize these things. So let us just calculate some numbers as to what are they. Suppose my original mass of the system is M. Mass of cloud. Okay. So when H2 goes to 2H, then what happens? Then you have... Uh, the 
total mass is m and uh, number of number of particles is equal to m by 2 m bar where m bar equal to mass of hydrogen atom. So, mass of uh, hydrogen molecule is equal to 2 m bar. Therefore, number of hydrogen molecules is equal to m by 2 m bar. Okay, now assume that epsilon d is equal to ionization energy, sorry, not ionization energy, dissociation energy of H2 to 2H. So, first of all, the gravitational potential energy reduced, which is there, is first absorbed into dissociation of hydrogen molecule. And so, total, so this is per molecule. So, total energy for dissipation is m by 2 m bar into ed. Is that okay? This is the total energy out of the potential energy released. This is the total energy which goes into dissociation of hydrogen molecules into hydrogen atoms. Is it fine? Yeah. Harish? Yes, sir. Bharti? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Kumsumana has left, is it? Oh, no, Hadia. Hadia has left. Okay, he's there. Okay. Hadia, is it okay? Okay, sir, mic is not working. Okay. So, this is the total energy of dissipation. Now, next comes when hydrogen goes to H plus plus E minus. And here, the mass of each of them is M bar. The total mass remains same. Therefore, number Sorry. Number of hydrogen atoms is equal to m by m bar, not to m bar, because it is now per, per atom. Okay. And if epsilon i is equal to it's just m bar because electrons are there, right? No, 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 no. It is oh. m bar because per part electrons, you just forget it now because hardly ah. any. Yeah. This is because now it's an atomic hydrogen. Yeah. Got it. So particle mass is. So number of particles is m divided by atomic hydrogen. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, what I'm saying is it's the number of particles which are getting ionized, not the final thing. Okay. There are, there are, there are so many hydrogen atoms. Mm -hmm. Capital yeah. M by m bar. And if Epsilon I is the ionization energy per hydrogen atom, then Epsilon I, okay, then total energy needed for ionization is m by m bar into epsilon i. Hence, for h2 to 2h plus plus 2e minus, total energy required is m by 2 m bar 
epsilon d plus m by m bar epsilon i which is equal to m by m bar epsilon d by 2 plus epsilon i. So this is the total energy which is required for forming hyd for, for making this into completely hyd uh, ionized hydrogen. Okay. And now where does this energy come from? This energy comes from gravity. Okay. So suppose initial radius of the cloud is Ri and final radius is Rf. Then we know that G m square by Ri minus g m square by r f. Sorry, other way around. Just a minute. Hi, Ekta. Hello. Hi. Ah. Um, I'll call you a little bit later. I'll give you a lecture in online. Astro. Anything urgent? Now, right? Okay, I'll just call you after. Okay, bye. bye. Okay, so yeah, I'm so okay. So let me put it this way. Uh, uh, GM by R F minus GM by R I is equal to the change in potential, modulus of the change in potential energy. Okay. I mean, because potential energy is negative, that's why. And this should be equal to m by m bar epsilon d. Epsilon d by 2 plus epsilon i. Now, let us take the case of epsilon d. Epsilon d happens to be 4.6 electron volts for H2 and epsilon I is, you all know, 13.6 electron volts for H. And so we have epsilon D by 2 plus epsilon I is equal to 4.6 by 2 plus 13.6 is equal to 2.39. So you need 15.9 electron volts to convert every hydrogen molecule to every, huh, no, 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 no. It is 15.9 electron volts Hold on. No, I have to be careful here. So I have H2 goes to 2H and this is 4.6 EV. H goes to H plus plus E, which is 13.6 EV. And this to balance the equation, I have to multiply by 2. And so I have H2 going to 2H plus plus 2E is equal to, huh, okay, is equal to, yeah, okay. So this is actually 31.8 EV. Basically, the point is, it is plus, it is per H2. Okay. Anyway, so this is the EV. And now, if I multiply this by by m by m bar for sun, this will come out to be 3 into 10 to the power 
39 Jews. Okay. And such a star, and so, so for sun, for example, it will start from 10 to the power minus 15 meters size to 10 to the power 11 meters. And so I have 1 by RF is much greater than 1 by Ri. And so, sorry, huh, because Ri is much greater than Rf. This is Ri. And so I can just neglect in this equation. In this equation, I can neglect this term with respect to this because uh, Ri is much larger. And so I have Gm by Rf should be equal to M by M bar epsilon d by 2 plus epsilon i. Okay. And uh, time scale for columns is given to free for time. Okay. And uh, the density for this will be, oh, sorry, this will be square here. Okay. Yeah. So here I wanted to make one important point which I forgot. I'll just tell you. Yeah. Okay. I'll just come to it. Okay. Uh, EGR is equal to. Yeah. So now the, the energy, the gravitational energy which is stored is minus of this. So it means that if I now just one minute. Yeah, so one thing is that the energy the gravitational potential energy is equal to minus G M square by R F equal to minus m by m bar epsilon d by 2 plus epsilon i and epsilon i. And I also know from Virial theorem that twice the kinetic energy plus kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to zero. And I know the potential energy from here. And so I have E kinetic energy is equal to um, E kinetic energy Okay, so, so twice E kinetic energy is equal to M by M bar epsilon D by plus epsilon I. And this goes here. Sorry, here there is a 2 here already. And uh, yeah. And I know that epsilon Ke should be equal to 3 by 2 times the number of particles times kt. And so this is equal to m by 2 m bar epsilon d by 2 plus epsilon i. And so the temp now I can write this quantity m by m bar is equal to n. So this and this cancels out. Okay. And this gives me kt is equal to kt is equal to I am having a problem with uh, this in the last year we had only m by m bar, right? Where's the factor of half? Where did it come? 
What is, oh, 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 wait, 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 sorry. No, no, no. I double counted it, you know. I put, no, just a minute. So I have, okay. No, no, so let me just do that. Yeah, I mean, I did a mistake here. Okay. Okay. So now I have 2KE is equal to minus EGR which is equal to M by M bar. So I'll put a 2 here. Epsilon D plus 2 Epsilon I. And so E kinetic energy is equal to M by 4 M bar Epsilon D plus 2 Epsilon I. No, no. Ah. I've done that. You have done it, huh? Oh, he was waiting for that. Oh. Oh, huh. You have done it, huh? No, I've done the first track. It was not in Paytm for me. Huh. It was in uh, IDBA. IDBA. Bank. So it is done. Okay, so this is there. And uh, now, I am not getting one factor of two. Okay, so now if this this should be equal to three by two kT into n is equal to m by four m bar epsilon d plus two epsilon i. Okay, and n is equal to m by m bar, and so I have kT is equal to one by 6 epsilon d plus 2 epsilon i. Okay. And this epsilon d plus this epsilon i, this will be 4.6 plus 27.2, which is equal to 32, no, 31.8. Is it okay? And so if I divide it by, so 31.8 divided by 6 comes to 5.9. Now, the, where I am seeing from, there is an extra factor of 2 here, which I don't know why it should come. Because per degree of freedom, okay, I will check this and get back to you. So, basically, point is, from here, I can find out the temperature of the, the final temperature. Okay? At hydrostatic equilibrium, when it is reached with all this. The interesting thing which I find is that the temperature is completely independent. So it will be kT is equal to 1 by 6 or 12. I don't, uh, I have to figure it out. Epsilon D plus 2 epsilon I. And so this is independent of what is the original mass of the cloud. Do you see the interesting thing here? It doesn't matter what the original mass of the cloud is. The temperature where it stabilizes is the same. When everything is ionized. And this corresponds to about 30,000 Kelvin. And this is independent of the protostar mass. Uh, is it clear? If we have same number of hydrogen, then it will have roughly the same temperature. That's uh, sorry, I didn't understand. What is it? Like, uh, if it had same number of hydrogen, then the cloud will be having roughly the same temperature. That's what you mean? Yes. Okay. No, no, same number of ions. No, what I'm saying is independent of what is the original mass of the cloud. The temperature will be the same. If they had same number of hydrogen, right? Same number of finite. No, no. 
No, 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 not same number of ionized hydrogens. You no. see, it is independent of the number, number or the mass now. Because this thing cancels out, M by M bar and N cancel out. Yeah. Okay. Is this so? So all the protostars for this particular contraction are thirty thousand Kelvin. Yes, yes, at the protostar, not the star. Yeah. See, that is it is now. Uh, I mean, so. It is now ionized. The fusion will only now start. It is right now ionized matter. This, I mean, is independent of mass of the proton. So originally these lumps are formed. Okay. Uh, but says uh, even before the collapse, the. Yeah. Hydrogen atoms had their own internal energy to the temperature, right? You said the temperature is oh, pretty low. But... That is very low, 20 Kelvin or something. Okay, so they cannot, you know... You just neglect G equal to zero here. Okay, so only by the virtue of collapse, they get energy to get ionized and so then... So most separate. of the hydrogen energy, internal energy is because of the collapse, because of the gravitational potential energy. And that is what heats the system. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, right. Okay. So now, once the protostar is uh, formed, then, uh, okay. so let us, uh, okay, so let me just change gear. I'll come back to this. Let us look at the radiation from a star. Suppose the luminosity of the star is See, basically, I'm trying gradually going towards what they call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for uh, for studying stars. Okay, so the luminosity of this star is say L, and the radius of the star is R. So it means on the surface. Intensity is L by 4 pi r square. Right? So, this luminosity is spread on the surface of the earth star. And so, this is the intensity, luminosity per unit area. But I know that since the photons from the stars have undergone sufficient collision, they are in equilibrium and hence form a black body. Okay. The photons are in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, and so they form a black body. And a black body radiation follows the Stephen Boltzmann law. This is the effective temperature. It means that sigma Te to the power 4 is equal to luminosity of the star divided by 4 pi r square, which means that the luminosity of the star depends on both the radius and the temperature. So it is 4 pi sigma r square Te4. All right? Yes. Okay. But now, there is something very interesting. Let us look at the... This is something which I told right in the beginning of this series of lectures. Suppose I have a star and it has... And as we saw, as the protostar is formed, everything becomes ionized. Which means that the photon inside the star cannot travel in a straight line, but it will keep getting scattered by scattering with all these charged particles. Now, suppose there was no scattering and it could directly travel out. Okay? 
then uh, let me just get the formula Ti is equal to solar radiation. Yeah. So this no. Okay. So now if suppose this radiation is directly being pumped out. Then what is the kinetic energy of this? The, kin the Sorry, the temperature, if it is kT, then we know that the source of this has been gravitational potential energy. Yeah, I know why he got that 12 factor because he has not used 3 by 2, but he has used 3 kT. Okay, but for order of air magnitude estimate, it's okay. Okay, so kT should be, so n kT should be g m square Achso, you put, I should put, I will put 3 by 2, but he puts 3. Okay, we'll just go by that okay? because this is a, a order of magnitude. G m square by r. Okay. And so kT is of the order of G m by 3 r because n is equal to capital M by m bar. Is that okay? Is it fine? Yes. Okay. Says, but if it's an order of magnitude approximation, we can avoid writing three also, right? I know. I, I, I agree. Actually, that is better. If you are removing two, you put three also. But okay. I mean, it's a question of... Yeah, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I would put... Kt is equal to gm square by r is more like it than uh, this one. Okay, fine. Okay, and this for sun, this comes out to be 0 0.5 keV. Which means that the intrinsic temperature of the sun is 6 into 10 to the power 6 Kelvin. Okay. Fine. Now, let us see the process by which the energy comes out of the star. So, it actually starts from some point. This is something which I did in the beginning. Goes some distance. The, the photon goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here. It's a kind of a complete random walk. And like this, at some point, it comes out. Now, what does this mean? It means that suppose capital D is the net displacement of the photon and with every mean free path, these are the net displacements. And uh, okay, this is a different N, okay. Let's see, uh, N0. Okay, so this is the vectorial sum. Now we want to calculate the total, I mean, so what I have to do, when it has to come out, then d square should be equal to L1 square plus L2 square plus Ln0 square plus, then you will have twice sum Li dot Lj i not equal to g. This will be the sum, right? Because this is the dot product, because the vector sum. Are you with me? Yes. yes. But now, since the large number of random additions, this will add up statistically to zero. And so, the net distance covered that is from the net distance covered will be equal to n naught times if l1, l2 are all same l square. That is, it is this is the usual thing about the random walk. You know, when there is a random walk, then the distance covered is root n, I mean, is mean free path times square root of n, which I n is the number of collisions. Right? Okay, so that is what it is. And so, 
uh, what I have is the number of collisions is equal to, and what is D? I need the time for D to be equal to the radius of the sun. So that the heat should come out. So my N naught is equal to radius of the sun divided by the mean free path. Is that okay? Uh, is it okay for everyone? Bharti, Harish, Anirudh? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So now, so it says something very interesting. So you can ask how much distance, how much time this photon has taken to come out, which I call T random walk, which will be equal to what is the total distance the photon has covered? It is N naught times L. Right? This divided by, and in every mean free path, it has traveled at the speed of light. All right? Yes. And this will be equal to, what is my N naught? Oh, here it is wrong. This should be square. Now my N naught is R naught square by L square. Now I have into L by C, which means the time taken for the random walk path is R naught square by LC. Okay, this is the time taken for the random work. Okay. Now, if suppose the thing had directly come out without any scattering, then then the free uh, the the free path of this would have been R naught by C. It means that T R W is equal to R naught by L times the free time. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Now suppose the thing was just freely coming out from the center then the luminosity would have been L prime, which is equal to 4 pi sigma r square t i prime. Four. Okay. That is the same formula as we used here, except the temperature will be the intrinsic temperature if it was straight coming out. Because it has not exchange this temperature with the surroundings. However, the actual temperature, is, the, 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 if there is a random walk, then the, temp, the luminosity will be 4 pi sigma r square T e square, T e 4. Okay? Which means that the temperature, huh, okay, just a minute. T E4. Yeah. So now for the same energy, see the luminosity is what? It is energy energy per time. Right? Yes. Okay. So it means that the energy emitted divided by the time for free uh, passage will be equal to 4 pi sigma r square t i square and the energy emitted for a random walk passage will be 4 pi sigma r square t e 4. Sorry. If I divide these two, I find that t R W by T F will be equal to T I four by T E. Okay, 
And so, uh, T i will be equal to, now what is T r w by T uh, e, sorry, T r w by T f, as I said, we had r by l. Right? When you, have, when you divide these two. Yeah. And so you have the intrinsic temperature is equal to R by L to the power 1 by 4 times Te. All right? Yes. So which means that L is equal to Te by Ti to the power 4 into R. Okay? Into R. And I know that the temperature of the sun is 6000 Kelvin and if this method of calculating Ti is there, that will happen to be 6 into 10 to the power 6 Kelvin. Which means that the... And if I know the radius of the sun, I can find out what is the mean free path of photon. And that comes out to be 1 millimeter. In other words, when the photon is coming out, it can only go for one millimeter distance as a free photon. It will immediately get scattered. And that is why this whole path of the photon is so much zigzag that it will take about 50,000 or 10,000 or some number like that years to come out of the sun. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, let us go back to the luminosity of the sun. So the luminosity of the sun is equal to 4 pi r square sigma into Ti4 L by r. And if I get the Ti from my gravitational collapse, I will get the luminosity of the sun to be 4 pi square by 3 to the power 5 sigma k power 4 g4 because, you know, kt will depend on g. That is where the power 4, power 4 comes. m bar to the power 4 into the mean density rho into L mean free path into m cube. Okay. I mean, it is just that I know I just calculate for kt i from gravitational collapse, right? You put all that. Just try it out. We can do it next time. If it doesn't come, we can get this luminosity. Okay? Is it okay? Yeah. Is that the mean density of the sun? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, roughly, luminosity will go as n cube. And... And if you actually look at data, this is how the data is. You can see the graph? Yes. Now, this line is the L going as, is on a log log graph. So the power law is a straight line with a slope of 3. So this is the line for m cube. And when you actually plot luminosity versus mass, these are the, so it's very close to m cube, but with small changes. 
So basically, this exponent is between 3 and 3.5. So this is how the masses of star change with luminosity. Okay. And uh, okay, this I am doing just as a prelude to coming to what is called the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. So probably I will do it next time. Today I will just close it at this point. Is it okay? So basically today we have uh, so today we have done more hardcore astrophysics. Previously we were just doing the physics. Now we are just put the whole thing in the context of stars. Okay. I will just make notes of this and then we share. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. Thank you, sir. Bye. 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 Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you.